Back in 1994, an up-and-coming studio called Shiny Entertainment put out their first game, a cartoony, run-and-gun platformer for the Genesis and Super Nintendo called Earthworm Jim, which told a wacky story about an alien super suit falling from the sky on top of a regular earthworm, imbuing him with powers and he has to fight off a series of insane villains who are trying to retrieve the suit. It got attention for its zany, insouciant, very 90s random humor, but also for its vivid graphics and its sharp, intense, responsive shooting and platform action. A sequel followed that was held in even higher regard, but instead of pumping out a third game in the series, Shiny decided to try their hand at an original property, developed in 3D from the ground up on more capable PC hardware. That game, called MDK, maintained Jim's zany humor, but sought to push computer graphical chips to their absolute limits. MDK tells the story of a crazy old scientist and inventor named Dr. Fluke Hawkins, who thinks he's discovered a revolutionary outer space phenomenon. But when the scientific community does not support him, builds his own space station, which he calls the Jim Dandy, as well as a robot dog named Max. He bribes a janitor named Kurt Hectic, who the developers said they named after Kurt Cobain and a line from Mike Lee's Naked, of all things, into joining Dr. Hawkins by offering him goulash, and sets out into orbit. He finds his initial research was mistaken, but accidentally discovers streams of energy that turn out to be giant alien vehicles intended to strip mine Earth. Kurt is reluctantly drafted into wearing a genetic suit Dr. Hawkins designed, entering the strip mining machines from above and destroying them from the inside out. The game is full of these quirky 90s gags, from the Jim Dandy to the goulash, from Dr. Hawkins keeping Kurt happy by programming his VCR properly, to the robot dog Max mostly wanting to tend to his vegetable garden. They have weapons in the game called things like the world's most interesting bomb, the very large hamster hammer, and the world's smallest nuclear explosion all of which feel like you-don't-know-jack categories. The kind of things that me, as an elementary school kid, would have laughed heartily towards at the time. But this was no slapdash effort, and the team worked exceedingly hard on the technological side. They wrote their own entire programming language, they used motion capture, which was groundbreaking at the time, and broke down motion scripts for each individual limb, allowing a much broader range of movements, and mapped the wireframed 3D models for the villains so meticulously that you could target specific limbs and body parts for attack. Their other big innovation was the sniper mode. In the wake of first-person shooters like Doom becoming all the rage in gaming, Shiny wanted a third-person perspective, but also had a first-person mode, where the player can zoom up to 100 times to perform a shot. The team wanted a seamless experience, and were determined to maintain a consistent resolution and pixel size. So any time they found frame rates dropping from an action, they either took it out or figured out ways to refine it to allow it to maintain 30 FPS. The other great structural innovation is Kurt's ribbon chute, a parachute built within his coil suit that deploys to allow him to float safely down through any area. I commended similar integration in the Rayman 2 episode, and it works just as well here, increasing strategy and saving frustration. Shiny ported MDK to Macintosh computers, and in fact, their parent company, Playmates Interactive, signed a deal to bundle the game in with the release of the original iMac. They also made an impressive port to the PlayStation by the company Neversoft, who we will discuss at length soon enough. Navigating the MDK port with little meaningful slowdown, 
and in some places expanding the quality, since the PS1 had a wider color palette than the PC's 256. MDK had gained high critical praise from across the spectrum, but Shiny Entertainment dissolved almost immediately, as many of their top workers left to form their own company called Planet Moon Studios, developing the strategy shooter Giants Citizen Kabuto. So development for MDK2 instead fell upon a newbie developer called BioWare who got some pushback for their inexperience, as their first release, a little game called Baldur's Gate, had yet to be released. BioWare decided to expand on the original MDK in lieu of reinventing the wheel, saying there was very little to critique about the first game, just trying to refine the things it did well and make it a little longer with more character development. BioWare added more platform and puzzle elements and made it so some sections let you play as both the robot dog Max and Dr. Hawkins, with each one having levels tailored to their specific skill sets. Max is a 200 hit point tank that can quad wield four guns at once, and his levels are the heavy firepower ones. Dr. Hawkins is expectedly much more fragile and mostly puzzle platformer based with a fun, sciency metric where each of his hands maintains an individual inventory that allows you to combine things Tears of the Kingdom style to make new items like an atomic toaster that shoots radioactive toast. The second game maintains the goofball, OMG, so random 90s humor of the original bouncing between flippy floop ginkgo biloba sort of epic bacon funny word sound stuff and a very cancelled early adult swim show sort of vibe. All the primary enemies are named sh like Spanky and Schwang Schwing and Emperor Zizzy Baluba, but also maintains the original game's fast-paced, responsive shooting and clever, playable controls. On the Dreamcast, MDK2 does the same clever workaround that Slave Zero does. It is also structured for mouse and keyboard freedom and needs two sticks for a system that only has one. So moving is done by the face buttons rather than by the stick, which is used for looking around. The camera is better here than in Slave Zero, though, and that same ribbon-shoot glide allows you to avoid a lot of the agonies of inexact aim that come standard with a lot of 3D third-person platformers. MDK2 is more challenging than MDK, but I welcome this, because my main issue with the first game was just that it was mostly pretty easy, and that could lead to it occasionally feeling monotonous. So the added difficulty kept the game engaging and the new character levels were a good time. MDK2 is the kind of game I've been waiting to find on this project. As modern and future-thinking as the Dreamcast has sometimes felt, 1999 and 2000 is sort of a very specific little transition point. Basically, the moment immediately preceding the new generation of shooters with the release of Halo on the Xbox in November of 2001, a flashpoint that fundamentally and permanently altered the landscape of the console shooter genre. So the games from immediately prior had to continue working within the constraints of the previous console generation, and clearly had the ambition for greater things, but not the ability. So a lot of these games have been admirable to witness, but not very fun to play. MDK2 bridges the gap between the stiff early 3D shooters and the twin-stick Genesis to immediately follow. It's visually interesting, it's fun to play, the technical things they attempt are all surprisingly successful, and even with the eye-rolling humor, it's at least got personality. And of all the shooting-based games that I've done for this project so far, this was basically the first one that I actually looked forward to coming back to. And all these years later, with no real activity, I believe MDK2 now qualifies as a hidden gem. Next time, 
I know, I know, we're all tired of hearing about yet another fighting game with a Nobel Prize winning physicist who goes mad with plasma power and puts his consciousness into a powerful cyborg body so he can become emperor of the world. But sorry, this is yet another one of those. 